Hello, welcome to the European Parliament in Strasbourg for this latest edition of Talking Europe. Now, this building has been particularly action-packed over the last week or so, the centrepiece event being Wednesday's State of the Union speech from Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker. Well, after he laid out his vision for his final year in the job and the long-term future of the EU, we're asking whether Juncker hit the right notes and in which direction Europe is heading. I'm very pleased to welcome to our studio four guests today from all across the continent and the political spectrum. From Italy, we are joined by Laura Ferrara from the Five Star Movement with the EFDD group here in the Parliament. Hello there. Hi, hello, good morning. Next to you, uh, one of the Vice Presidents of the Parliament from Poland, Zdzisław Krasnodemski from the ECR group. Hello there. And to my left, we're joined uh, from Germany's SPD MEP Jakob von Weizsäcker, who is with the Socialists and Democrats group here in the Parliament. Hello. Hello. And uh, finally, another Vice President of the Parliament uh, joining us from the Czech Republic, Pavel Telička from the ALDE Liberals Group. Hello. Hello, thank you. OK, well, first off, we're going to start off with a little recap for everybody of some of the key points that came out of Jean-Claude Juncker's speech. Take a look at this quick report. His last State of the Union speech, but Jean-Claude Juncker made it clear he's still looking to the future. Speaking to the European Parliament, the President of the European Commission laid out his vision of a Europe that has largely overcome economic and migration crises, but still has work to do. External borders must be protected more effectively. So we're proposing that the number of border agents financed from the European budget by 2020 will be 10,000. And we're making a proposal to enlarge the European Refugee Agency. Among other policy plans, a pledge popular in northern member states to end the Europe-wide mandatory changing of clocks between winter and summer. Other promises tackling bigger issues, a vow to combat money laundering, new laws against election manipulation and determination for Europe to be a power player on the world stage. I would like us to make tangible progress as far as strengthening our foreign policy is concerned. We will have to strengthen our ability to speak with one voice on foreign policy. With the UK due to quit the bloc in March and European elections scheduled for May, the calendar's packed between now and the end of Jean-Claude Juncker's term in office. His overall message for the time that's left, in his own words, making our imperfect union ever more perfect. There you go, some of the main points from Jean-Claude Juncker there in his final State of the Union speech here at the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Uh, he began that speech by talking about making our imperfect union more perfect every day. I think that's a pretty good starting point for our discussion. I'll perhaps come to you first, Mr. Telichka. Uh, what do you make of that? Is this imperfect union getting better every single day? It does feel currently like there are lots of internal divisions and splits. Well, sometimes we do uh, uh, take two steps forward and then one step backwards. So I'm answering your question that uh, not always we take the right decision at the right time and not always we are effective and efficient. Uh, but uh, as concerns uh, Jean-Claude Juncker's speech, I think that uh, he put an emphasis on the unity of the European Union. So mm. this time he avoided uh, anything that would be dividing, splitting, which I think is uh, wise for the last year, where we will have to take still a number of uh, important decisions uh, and, and policy uh, shifts. He also emphasized uh, uh, the priorities. I think that he was uh, also provocative on some of the issues. I think that he introduced uh, uh, issues like uh, qualified majority the voting uh, uh, in the area of foreign security policy, which someone might see as in fact dividing, or I'm sure that that will be divisive uh, to some extent. He spoke of the defense union. So there were issues which are definitely not uh, consensual, but uh, on uh, the topical issues, on some of the problems we have been dealing with in recent past, not always effectively, I think that he was uh, uh, pretty cautious. Mr. von Weizsäcker, same question to you. You represent Germany, the biggest member state in the EU, and often seen perhaps by some of the smaller and more peripheral member states geographically as uh, leading the European too far in the direction it wants to go in. I mean, I, I think his speech certainly resonated with me for a simple reason. Um, he pointed to the fact that in the 21st century, there's so many areas where even 
a large member state like Germany could not possibly uh, solve the problems on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's key. I mean, that's key uh, for Europe in the 21st century to come together to solve problems that we cannot solve individually as countries. Uh, and now, of course, he was also brutally honest that in many areas, while in principle Europe can offer the solution, uh, we haven't quite managed to do so. And now in order to deflect some criticism of, of the Commission, he said, well, and by the way, in many areas we wanted to go much further, mm. but we were blocked by others, and most mm. notably uh, the Council. Now, uh, whether you agree with that assessment, I think also the Commission could have done more to move forward in some areas. Uh, but, but nevertheless, I think, I think that's the gist, and I think that's fitting in a, a, for a State of the Union address, where obviously until May 2019 there are a certain number of issues that still can be addressed and need to be addressed, but uh, we are talking about a transition period uh, where the election is coming up, the question is what are the key areas for the election and then of course what are we going to do in the, in the five years after the election. We're talking there about areas where the European Union has been sort of st uh, stuck or hamstrung by itself. Uh, one of those main areas, I think, perhaps was migration, which uh, has affected your country, Italy, uh, very heavily, Laura Ferrara. Um, on migration, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker said that we have had a lot of success. Numbers of arrivals in the eastern Mediterranean are down 97% since 2015. Numbers in the central Mediterranean down 80% since 2015. Uh, he believes that, uh, that it sounded like he thinks that this is a problem that can be solved and he can see the path to solving it. Do you agree? I think that uh, on the issue of migration, there are still a lot of um, problems, a lot of difficulties that we have to solve at a European level. And uh, the key point is exactly that, that uh, until now we are trying to have a, a European approach, but at the end uh, there are um, still debates, discussions uh, uh, in the European Council, uh, in the European Parliament, and uh, every single member state uh, is uh, left alone. Uh, if I look at my country, at Italy, uh, there are still many difficulties and um, uh, now here in the European Parliament we are uh, working uh, uh, on the reform of uh, all the European common asylum system but uh, the situation is still the same and um, all of this summer uh, when uh, all of the uh, boats uh, with migrants mm -hmm. uh, arrived uh, on our coasts uh, there were all um, there were yeah always uh, the, the same problems uh, because uh, if there is uh, the Dublin regulation uh, they are obliged to remain in our country and when we uh, knock to the door of the European Union and we ask for uh, European solidarity and European cooperation we will send the European Commission that says uh, it's not uh, up to us, it's not our competence. That is true because there are international conventions that uh, regulate the uh, operation in the Mediterranean. But um, it's uh, like a negotiation that we have to put on the table uh, each single day that we have a boat on the Mediterranean. And uh, we would like to see uh, yeah, a cooperation, a solidarity. That's the European Union, I think. And that is what is written in the treaties. Mm -mm. Mm. Mr. Krasnodamski, uh, after all of these opinions, uh, I'll come back to that first question. Jean-Claude Juncker's idea that he wants to make our imperfect union in Europe more perfect. And, and he, like I said, seems to think it's going in a positive direction. Do you agree? No, no. And uh, I was a little disappointed. Uh, uh, I think it is not proper assessment, you know, of the State of Union. If you take the, the speech and we compare this what we read uh, uh, every day in the in, in the European press, and we we see as uh, different countries with uh, troubles. This is not only a problem of migration. Italy, you, you, if we look how Germany is polarized today, it was a very consensual so society. There are many many problems, and there are also what we have. Uh, there's a new in European Union. We have a competing vision of the future of, of Europe. Are you talking and about uh, what he mentioned about the east, west, north, this south is not, splits? Yeah, yes, he, 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 appeal, he, he was talking about unity, but uh, if, we, if, we, if we compare this the situation that he, um, he gave his first uh, speech uh, about uh, State of the mm -hmm. Union at the beginning of the Commission, is the Union now more perfect than it was uh, four, five years ago? 
the answer is no. Actually, uh, I would say during uh, during uh, yeah, this period, election period, uh, Europe became much more uh, divided, and there are some conflicts. Mm. And you, you, you know, and this, the same time we have in this plenary session also the questions of hunger. Actually, it's uh, all what also Commission is doing is actually is contributed to splitting Europe, not to unite Europe. I would I'd say. Like perhaps come back to the Telichka on that, because um, this idea of east west splits, um, as a member of a Central European country, uh, one of the newer members of uh, the European Union compared to the likes of France and Germany, um, do you see those splits? Do you think that they can be healed? Do the parts of Europe understand each other? Well, I would say that the speech of Jean-Claude Juncker, as I've said, was uh, pretty cautious in this respect, not to uh, fuel into uh, some of the, let's say, sensitivities, which clearly have uh, reached the surface, and I would say mainly on the carrier of the migration crisis. I mean, on the other hand, uh, while many have not refrained from unnecessary steps, unnecessary proposals, uh, uh, consideration of instruments, uh, strong words, that does happen, I don't think that this is really the issue. I would say that we've got other issues that we need to tackle that are uh, imminent for the uh, uh, citizens uh, of the European Union. Such but as? allow me just uh, maybe uh, to uh, present a different, uh, though also mm -hmm. Central European point of view. Uh, you know, I would not go into uh, that uh, maybe. Uh, interesting uh, uh, from a media point of view uh, a debate whether we are more perfect or less. But the reality is that the European Union, whether it's 80, 85, 90 percent, in fun functions very well. We just take it for granted. Yeah? The internal market functions, these functions. I mean, we can speak of a number of policies, a number of uh, legislation, a number of decisions which are well put in practice. But the truth is that in the recent years we had several challenges on which uh, we didn't just manage well enough and in good time mm -hmm. and is the reason I mean in the European Union partly yes but who is for who, uh, who forms the European Union and this is the member states and the real problem that I see is the crisis of politics in a number of member states a lot of the problems that colleague Krasnodebsky referred to in fact have the origin in the member states in their yeah. politics yeah, may I add something but it is also the questions of the relation between European institution and the member states is the questions of what you what you address the questions of unity of our our concept of foreign policy. There are many issues, and it is not the divide, not the split between the east well, and the west, and the new and uh, old national, member. National yeah. governments uh, can be seen to be exploiting certain issues uh, and saying, "Oh, this is this is no, Brussels' no, the, fault. This is the not, fault it, of the EU." No, it's. it's the, I think it, yes. they are really problem of European Union. Laura Ferrara. Yes, I think that uh, many times we heard uh, uh, it's uh, mm. the European Union that is imposing us uh, these decisions, mm -hmm. uh, these regulations, uh, etc. But they uh, didn't say, uh, yes, but we are the European Union. Uh, we are seated in the European Council. Mm -hmm. uh, we are contributing to take these decisions. Uh, this is the real problem because otherwise the European Union is, uh, uh, is very bad. It's something that uh, mm. just uh, give uh, you know, bad Juncker things. You was to correct that. Uh, the European Council, the Council is quite often uh, blocked, and, and yeah. I very much agree with you. I mean, and we, we blame even in areas where, where the mm. European Union has insignificant competence. I, I agree entirely, and unfortunately, um, there is a strong element of cynicism involved where some member states, n most notably uh, those with governments that are most nationalistic, are going to say, well, you see, Europe doesn't solve your problems, so we have to go back to the nation state. Mm. But the reality is, of course, they're making it impossible to find a proper European solution because they're blocking European solutions that would work in the Council. And so they, what I, I'm most profoundly worried about is this element of cynicism and that sort of discourse. Are you, for example, talking about Hungary, which has been a big topic this week, and Viktor Orban talking about Hungary being misunderstood by Europe and insulted? Well, yes, of course, this week Hungary is a subject, but, but this is a more general observation. I can talk about the Czech Republic, I mean, mm -hmm. about the Czech politics. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, the way that uh, uh, the government uh, or the government parties or the president, in fact, hijacked some of the issues in, in, in a way which uh, basically have one single aim, and that is to succeed and utilize that in the European elections. And that is counterproductive and not just cynical, but I think that it's going to come back as a boomerang. Well, yeah, we do have the European is, elections coming up. But indeed. it is only one side of the story. The other side of the story is ideology in our house, in Parliament, you know, dogmatism, lack of respect. That's you politics. Know, That's politics. No, it's, it's, it, 
it's something what, what is uh, was it also a, a big a big problem, problem. and it is detachment well. of the of the also European uh, institution from the from the feeling and sentiments of the people. Well, we'll perhaps come to a positive note. My sense of the European Parliament is that we spend so much time together that this kind of understanding each other, respecting one another, is actually um, um, a, a process that is well fostered here. Whereas perhaps in the council they don't meet quite often enough yeah, right. uh, and, and there may be more pronounced problems along those lines uh, uh, that you mentioned. So, so I, I, think, I think Parliament offers an opportunity here uh, to overcome some of these blockages but, but of course uh, we're not in a capacity to take certain initiatives that need taking because uh, at the moment we simply as Parliament do not have the right to initiate certain new rules ourselves. And that's I think where uh, Juncker's speech if I may say uh, uh, lacked something, and I would say a little bit of ambition exactly on issues like, uh, uh, and I understand that it's not for the Commission, but just to highlight that some of the bottlenecks uh, have certain rules, and in fact we, we, we could manage, and I, I do agree with you that in the Parliament maybe we, we could manage even more, but in fact a parliamentarian today doesn't have a legislative initiative. It lies with the so-called unelected Brussels bureaucracy. All right, well, unfortunately, that is all we've got time for in this debate on the State of the Union within the EU in 2018. Thank you all very much, Laura Ferrara, Zdzisław Krasnodamski, Jakob von Weizsäcker and Pavel Telichka. Thank you all for being with us. And that's it for the programme. We'll see you in part two here on France 24.